is Robin with Creative 210 Mom, and in today's video, we're going to be talking about the books we read in the month of March. So, welcome back to my channel. My name is Robin, and this is Creative 210 Mom. This channel is all about homeschooling, parenthood, and thriving in the day to day. And in today's video, we're going to be talking about the books that we read in March. I have quite a few here, and I tend to be long winded in these videos. So I'm going to try to give you a more brief overview this month. I think I have, well here I have about five. I think I read about nine or ten books this month. Completely accidentally, not intended at all. I was trying to slow down. <laughs> I'm going to break them into uh, fiction, nonfiction, and our family read aloud. So feel free to skip through this video if you're short on time. Let's talk about fiction, and I'm going to insert some videos because um, I had a few of these that were ebooks. And the first book that I read in the month of March was Letters of Trust. This is the story of a young couple. The wife has moved away from her family. She's newly married, and her husband takes her to live near his parents. She loves her husband very much. Uh, her parents were slightly hesitant to let them get married, but of course they gave their blessing. And what happens along the way is she offers to watch her uh, young brother-in-law when her in-laws go out for their anniversary. And this little boy and her husband are very close, and he keeps promising his younger brother that he will teach him how to swim. Well, it gets put off and put off till one day the younger brother sinks away and he drowns on the, in their pond on their property. Uh, her husband internalizes his pain and he turns to drinking and becomes an alcoholic. And all this time she is a newlywed, she starts to discover what's happening. And of course in the Amish culture, she is very private and doesn't know how to deal with all of this, who to turn to, who to trust. And um, he turns to alcohol and it's all about the ups and downs of their marriage and how she has to learn to deal with this. And the title comes from Letters of Trust because she begins to open up to a friend of her, hers that she has moved away from. This was a review book, so I'm gonna link my full review down below. I kind of go back and forth on this one. As far as being Amish, Amish fiction, there was a formula to the storyline. There, It's very gentle. There's not a lot of harsh in-your-face reality, but it is a different storyline than what you typically find from Amish fiction. Dealing with alcoholism, dealing with internalizing pain, learning to forgive oneself. In that respect, it was engaging and took a little bit of a different turn. I think it's a topic that needs to be addressed more uh, and probably in a balanced way. This felt a little too gentle. Sometimes I've read other books that are almost too harsh. There needs to be this understanding of forgiving oneself and so I felt like this story was a step in the right direction. The next fiction book that I read in the month of March was The Secret Wild. This book was a complete departure from the first book, which was very, very serious. This is a middle grade read, and I was able to get my hands on it from the library. I heard about it from Jessica at the Waldock Way. Basically, we have this young girl whose parents are very famous botanists, and she tends to get into a lot of trouble. So they send her to London to live with her uncle so that he can watch her, and he's very scatterbrained. He has no idea what's going on. And she gets to London and she discovers that she can talk to this plant, so they can communicate. And there is another famous, well-known biologist who is running amok and developing these man-eating plants. <laughs> and they are taking over the city of London. So it's all about her relationship with this small plant that she can communicate with, her trying to make friends with the next door neighbor boy who's sort of reclusive and their relationship and how they are going against this um, mastermind that is trying to overtake London. I felt like it was pretty good, not a lot of red flags. I handed it off to my 11 year old afterwards. There's one or two spots that get a little gruesome and he even kind of cringed a little bit. But when we both got to where the action was really ramping up, we were, we neither of us could put it down. So, cute, cute story. Would definitely recommend probably 
uh, 10 to 13 age range. Book number three in the fiction category was Sadie by Sarah Price. This is book number three in a series of books that are Amish retellings of famous fairy tales. So last summer I read the first two books and they covered Beauty and the Beast and they covered uh, Cinderella. So this one, we have Sadie. She's an only child of her father. Her mother passed away when she was young and he has since remarried and her mother cannot get pregnant. And she blames Sadie for this, tries to arrange in a marriage. Sadie runs away and ends up in the forest with um, seven brothers who are dwarfs. Very much so. These are so funny. They're not just like kind of playing with the fairy tale. In a lot of ways, they really go into the fairy tale and mirror a lot of things. So her Prince Charming comes along, finds her there. She's allergic to apples. Her stepmother tries to poison her with apples of all things. So they are um, definitely a nonsensical read if you just want to get into it and be silly with the fairy tale retelling part of it. You're, it's, pretty hit you over the head obvious that this is the story that they're retelling. I um, I had to be in the right mood for this one. I've had it on my reading list for quite a while, but I knew it was going to be a very obvious retelling of the fairy tale. So if you go into it knowing that and you just want to have fun with the story, then it's a good one to check out. All right, I have the other two fiction books in front of me. Um, Swiss Family Robinson. Now, I assigned this to my sixth grader as part of his language arts curriculum. So then, of course, I kind of had to do the reading with him as well to keep up because I was having him do written narration. So I wanted to make sure that he was following the story. So I was reading about a day ahead of him. This is probably my fourth or fifth time through the book. I love it. I went online and looked up some reviews of the book, some reviews of the Disney retelling. A lot of people felt like this was so slow and they re really liked the movie. I like both. Um, the movie is a lot faster, it's a lot more concise, there's a lot more action. This has a lot of telling about the animals, the um, environment that they find themselves in. I feel like this is a really good, if you're following Charlotte Mason for your homeschool, this is a really good way to learn about that part of the world because there's so much detail so much about how the father knows how to use stuff around him, knows how to identify the plants and the animals and what parts to use. So I really like Swiss Family Robinson. It's a favorite of mine, obviously four or five times through and I'm still glowing when I talk about it. I think if you haven't read the full unabridged version, I think everyone should. The other book, and this is the last fiction book that I had, was The Kaya Girl by Mamle Wolo. This is a new to me author, and I believe she's a pretty decently new author as well. I don't think she's done a whole lot. Looking at the back, I'll just say she writes fiction and poetry. Uh, this is a story of a young girl who goes to live with her aunt. Her mother is pregnant and she's really struggling with this pregnancy. She has to be on bed rest, and her father's a doctor, so she goes to live with the aunt and work in the market. Now, she's lived kind of a upper class lifestyle, and her aunt has a shop in the market in Ghana. I think it was Ghana. And there she meets a, an immigrant girl who they are called the, the Kayayo, and they put the baskets on top of their head and they will carry the customer stuff out to wherever they're going. So they're sort of for hire. And these two girls strike up a friendship. So obviously we have a, a girl who's lived a higher class lifestyle and an immigrant, almost slave. She discovers that she's living in the market. She's paying rent to live in one of the shops every night. And then she has to be out first thing in the morning and out all day because she can't be in the shop. They strike up an unlikely friendship and through the whole thing they begin to learn each other's stories and how different they really are and yet how similar and it gives both of the girls a better perspective on life. I really liked it. I was reading it, thinking about passing it off to my 11 year old 
Uh, the only thing I would say that was in it is there is a little bit of, there's talking about some arranged marriages, which I don't think is a bad thing, uh, but uh, it was talking about like crushes, the girls had crushes, and so I don't know if my son <laughs> would really be interested in that, but I may pass it off to my 15 year old daughter. I think she would really like it. Other than that, there's really no red flags, super clean story. Um, definitely could go as young as probably 11 or 12. All right, so let's talk nonfiction. I've been following the Thousand Hours Outside podcast, and one of the recommended books recently was Outdoor Kids in an Inside World. So I was able to get a copy of this book from my library, and basically the author's mission is to make outside activities more accessible for more families. So he follows, he starts um, at sort of a lower level, which would be foraging. We could go out in the woods and find fresh blackberries. And he moves all the way up to going on a hunting trip with your kids. Now, I have spent quite a bit of time outside uh, for most of my life. And even this book did not feel accessible to me. Uh, maybe it's because of where I live currently. I live in more of an urban setting, suburban setting. Um, but it did not feel accessible. So I, I don't know what I expected from this book. The author uses a lot of stories from his life, talks about um, his kids and how he's done a lot of these things with his kids and what it looked like, which was great. But for me, it still felt really overwhelming. Even some of the lower steps, um, he does talk about fishing, which I think is a good entry point into a lot of that. But uh, I don't know, for me, it just felt um, unattainable, it still felt overwhelming. So I would probably pass on this one in the future. It was a very easy read. If you live in more of a rural setting, maybe, but possibly at that point, you're probably already doing a lot of the stuff that's addressed in this book anyway. From there, I moved on to Windows to Our World. This is a book that's been written by the founder of the Thinking Tree Journals or Dyslexia Games. If you're in the homeschool world, those probably, you might uh, have some vague recollection of those. They're very open-ended, um, sort of an unschooling philosophy. I picked up this book because I know the author has adopted kids from Ukraine, and my husband and I have both been there, so I was interested to hear her story. Uh, she does not even address that in this book, which was a big disappointment for me. I was really hoping that that would be addressed, but I think that this book was written prior to a lot of that coming out. This is her story of finding the Lord as a young teen, meeting her husband in her teenage years. They were together for a long time before they got married. Um, and she talks a lot about how the Lord guided her through different jobs, different opportunities on the mission field. That was inspiring and encouraging, but a lot of the book was these short little vignettes of what a blessing it is to be a mom, what a blessing our kids are. Um, the little stories of the fingerprints on the window that I think we have all heard when our kids are young, that the, the days are long, but um, how's it go? The moments are long, but the days are quick or something like that. <laughs> so if you're looking for a read to encourage you in motherhood, if you're looking for something to encourage you a little bit in missions, uh, this was an okay read, but it just was not addressing some of the questions that I had about her life. Um, sort of as an adoptive mom. That was what I was really hoping would be addressed in this one. And the other nonfiction book that I read in the month of March was The Living Page by Lori Best Vader. If you have been watching these videos, you will remember I read this book in the fall. <laughs> but I read it very quickly. It is a quick and easy read. It is so easy to read through this quickly and to be inspired and to be encouraged. And then, at least if you're me, all that information flies out of your brain. So I wanted to go through and really savor it. I picked it up, started it at the beginning of February, I think. This is the maybe two days left in March, and I just finished it earlier this week. I wanted to sit down, take notes on it, really soak it in. Um, I've taken a few notes on what notebooks we want to incorporate next year in our homeschool. We are not fully Charlotte Mason, but I find a lot of benefit in that philosophy. So I was taking notes on how I want to incorporate these. She, this is probably the most comprehensive, well laid out uh, 
piece of work that I've seen on keeping notebooks. So if you are diving headlong into Charlotte Mason, definitely, I would even purchase this. I got it from our school library, but it is well worth the price because it would be a great reference for you for over the years. She talks about how different notebooks come about in different forms and how they evolve and stay with your students. So even though we're not fully Charlotte Mason, I was really inspired by this one and so glad that I took the time to really read through it slowly and um, allow it to kind of form my vision for next year. So we're on to our last category and I actually have physical books for this category and that is our family read alouds. We have the Mysterious Benedict Society. This book is a beast. At almost 500 pages, this took us nearly two months to get through. Um, it's written at a fifth grade reading level. I read this with my ninth grader and my fifth grader. My ninth grader and I went back and forth. We had days we loved it and days that we didn't. You're following the story of four children who've been recruited by Mr. Benedict to infiltrate this sort of villain's lair. He has a school where he's supposed to be providing um, the kids a higher education, but Mr. Benedict has discovered that this man is actually sending messages. He's sending subliminal messages and he's using the kids at his school to do it. So these four children are sent to infiltrate this scheme because this man is going to take over the world. It's all about their adventures on the island where the school is. There's a lot of riddles and puzzles and sort of a spy feel to it. If you've ever seen Spy Kids, I think that movie came out in the 90s. Uh, similar, similar feel. Um, there were a few chapters that <laughs> sort of felt like you were on a tangent and they had nothing to do with what was actually happening. Um, it was cute. I stopped at book one. My 11 year old wanted to go on to the rest of the series. My daughter and I had had enough by the time we were done with this one. It was, it was okay. And then we read a really, really short one, The Arrow Over the Door by Joseph Bruchok. Last month I talked about um, another book by this same author. This book has a similar feeling. We are wrapping up our medieval history and getting ready to go into the early modern age next year for our history curriculum. And so that's why I threw this one in. It's told from the viewpoint of two boys, similar age. One is an Indian scout who is working with the British, I believe, as they are um, in the revolution. So, he and some others are working to scout this out, and the other viewpoint is a young Quaker boy, and he is struggling with his family's belief of um, non-resistance, they won't fight, they are friends, they are friendly, and he's struggling with that because he's seeing this death and war around him, and he wants to rise up and protect his community. And eventually these two boys come together and what happens when they meet. Their stories are intertwined. You go back and forth between the two and you find out that they're very similar and yet very different and what's going to happen when they meet together. Very quick read. Probably about 90 pages. Wasn't sure I was going to like it. Uh, not a lot of action filled but a unique perspective for that time in history. So that's all the books that I read in the month of March, as well as our family read alouds. Leave me a comment down below and let me know what are you reading or do any of these spark your interest? And of course, be looking out for another video like this one at the end of April where I will share what we read in the next month. Um, as far as what's coming up, I am working on... What's my fiction reading right now? Oh, I am doing The Weaving of Life, which I talked about in my spring reading list by Linda Byler. That one I will share in April. And for my nonfiction, I am reading Praying Circles Around Your Children. That's a very quick read, and I should finish it in the next couple of days. After that, I'm hoping to have a copy of Glow Kids. So be on the lookout for those at the end of April. I hope you guys enjoyed this one, and we'll see you next time. Bye, guys.